start streaming now. Are you recording? Gazina. Yeah, Jeffrey. So it's lunch hour mm -hmm. at a Catholic school. It's a boys' middle school, right? Mm -hmm. And the boys. Where is this going? <laughs> <laughs> the boys come in one end and they pick up their tray and they go down the long line and get all their food and then they go sit down. So uh -huh. as soon as they enter, the first thing there is a big basket of bread yeah. and the mother superior is there and she says, now boys, just take one piece. God is watching you. <laughs> well, down at the other end, some kids have already gotten their food and they're by the big tray of chocolate chip cookies. Mm -hmm. And one boy says to the other one, Take all you want. God's watching the bread. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> so great. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Ah, episode seven. Yep. Bagels and donuts. All the round things with holes in them That's that are right. delicious. Shall we start? Let's start. So okay. Jeffrey, you're up first. I am going to go get the bagels out of get refrigeration. So you can talk to me for a bit. So the way this is going to work, as we have in the past. We're going to do things a little backwards. Please note that the recipes, there are links to all of them in the description. But also another thing, there are three links there. One is to a King Arthur milk bread recipe because I'm making a milk bread donut. And then there's another link that will take you to my recipe for the milk bread that I'm using today and a video of how to make the dough because I'm not going to be making the dough today because that would take too long. But it's a fantastic video, 15 minutes just on how to make the dough. And it will show you how to make a dough for buns. But I use that same dough to make donuts, cinnamon rolls, just loaves of bread. It's fantastic. So off to Jeffrey again. Click on the link to that bagel recipe. That's what he's doing now so you can follow along. Jeffrey, those are gorgeous. So you're going to be boiling them off first. Yep, these were mixed yesterday and then shaped and they've been overnight in the refrigerator they're getting pretty puffy so they definitely want to go in I'm gonna do three different methods of baking one a good old style standard classic on a soaked bagel board and one I'm gonna bake straight out on a sheet pan and the third one I'll bake it on a silicone baking mat that I'm going to put onto pizza stone in the oven. So what you are boiling them in right now is a solution of water and what? This is malt syrup, which is a pretty traditional way to do it. Honey is a perfect substitute. If you can't find or if you don't want to go to the expense of malt syrup, don't worry about it. Um, the addition of a sweet okay. sorry guys we're going to continue while we do the sound just talk loudly Jeffrey the addition of the honey or the malt syrup will help give a little bit of a sheen Can you talk in here, maybe? Yeah, sure. Okay, let me, let me take it. So, we're just, that's why I figured I'd go first when you're talking. But now you are, if you can hear me at all, coating them in the seat. Because they're nice and wet, they're just sticking them up, no problem. Is it poppy and sesame? Yeah. And the 
you have a me and Poppy. Good. Good. So we're going to be taught, we got to speak a little more loudly because our sound went a little wonky. Okay, but we can be heard? I believe so, right? Can, can we be heard? Yes. Good. And another question. So you are um, putting them on a sheet pan now, but the oven right now is at 500. It's relatively high. Well, it's very high for, a, for an oven. So why so high and such a fast bake? Not that you're not doing a thousand and one things at once. I've got to focus. Yes. Okay. You got it. That's the way these go. Um, just let me stay here. Okay. Start bagels nice and high because you'll get a really nice distinction between the crust and a chewy but more moist interior. If you start it too low, it'll elongate the bake time and you're going to have a dried out product, which you don't want. One thing you'll want to keep in mind is the length of boiling. Um, if the bagels are slightly over risen, which these are, then you'll want to reduce the length of boil, otherwise they're going to get too puffy. So I'm just boiling these for maybe 45 seconds. If they were colder and less developed, then I would do them for upwards of two minutes. Yeah. It also depends on how chewy you want your bagel. I so like mine very chewy. Then what you would do is boil it less so it's a little denser. Yeah. Right? So you can manipulate the overall texture simply by the length of boil. These are a little over risen because the 25 minutes of driving from my house to here, they were in the back of my truck and they started warming up. So, but I think they're going to be okay. So I am really interested in your board there that they're upside down upon, and that's old school, right? This is totally old school. Traditionally, bagels were made by Jewish bakers. They go back to the first mention of them comes from Krakow in 1610. Um, they, let me put these in, then we'll keep yep. talking a little bit more. And he's putting, so. Let me leave this the, here for a moment. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, the bagel board. Thank you. And then this one goes. Or this was supposed to be going on the stone, but it's not. It's going to go right That's there. Okay. And then that one can go right in the middle. middle. Okay. So, let me gather my thoughts here. Yep. Krakow. That's where you were. You got it. Okay, so bagels go back hundreds and hundreds of years. They were a moderately pricey product for a long time. They were somewhat genetically related to an old Polish product whose name I will not correctly pronounce. Obzarzanek. Obzarzanek. Say that three times fast. Which was a ring-shaped product that was made for close to a thousand years at least since the 13th. There was great symbolism to the Ovarzanek, as well as to the bagels. The symbolism being the roundness represented eternity. And so they were really special products. They were eaten at births, at weddings, at funerals, uh, and before feast days, things like that. Eventually, bagels became a bagel seller with somebody who was in the most indigent poverty imaginable. It was a very, very, very lowly for profession. In Poland, at one point, Jews, who were the bagel makers, were forced outside the city walls. Uh, and back then, if you were outside the city walls, you were pretty much alone because people didn't want to be out there where they might be risking some danger. And it was in 1683 that the Polish king, Jan Sobieski, he gave the bagel makers permission to come back inside the city walls, so he was highly regarded, as you would imagine, by the bagel makers. And so now you are going to be... This is a ripe bagel dough that Gazina made earlier today, but I'm now going to divide and shape. It's 
over two hours old, so it's definitely got plenty of fermentation. And I'm going to divide these into 114 gram pieces. For you. And uh, the other thing to distinguish this bagel from others is it starts with a pat fermenté. This one does. There are many, many ways to make bagels. It's almost guaranteed that the original bagel makers, if they had some leftover dough, they were not going to throw it out. They would be adding it into the next batch. That's a practice that bakers have practiced for, well, since baking began. So to have some kind of a pre-ferment in your bagel dough is not at all unusual. Um, sourdough bagels are very nice. Bagels with whole grains can be nice. Um, cinnamon and blueberry, I'm out the door. Yeah, I'm not, I, I'm not there for those. I, I, I like them savory or not at all. So I'm going 114 grams. Or four ounces? Yep. Four so that ounces. makes 12 total from this yep, recipe? Yep, this will be a recipe for 12. And again, if, if you, we were having sound troubles earlier, if you missed it or could not hear us, Jeffrey boiled the bagels uh, in a solution of malt and water for about 45 seconds, I'd yeah. say. Uh, and he did it on the lower range because... Because they were pretty puffy already, a little puffier than I wanted them, in fact. Um, but you can also use honey. You do not want to use, however... Yeah, we didn't finish that. So yes. the distinction between bagels and pretzels, okay? Pretzels are traditionally dipped in a lye bath, sodium hydroxide, which is extremely caustic. It's at the very high end of the um, alkaline base scale. And nowadays, a lot of people, rather than using lye, which can be very dangerous to use, they use baking soda, where you'll boil water with 10% baking soda and put your pretzels in there. It's not a true pretzel, from the, in, at least in terms of the old German true pretzels. Um, but nevertheless, it's very common to see pretzels done that way. But, but to finish that thought, you would not use that in no. making bagels? No, no. Okay, so there's my 12. I have a little leftover piece. <laughs> now Angel gonna, share, kind of like whiskey. <laughs> now I'm going to shape these into cylinders striving to have no taper. Those of you who make a lot of baguettes, your hands instinctively want to make a taper. We don't want to taper these. So tight, tight, tight cylinders and strive to have them all more or less the same length. So basically these six fingers are just walking it down. At the bottom, my thumbs go in and just make a good seam. These will not take too long to relax. Once I've shaped them, I don't want them to relax for too long. We've already got poppy seeds on this guy. Um, because if they get puffy, they won't look good after the bake. When there was a huge number of immigrants coming through Ellis Island in New York City around the beginning of the 20th century. A lot of those immigrants, as we know, came from places like Russia and Poland, places that had a history and a tradition of bagel making. The Lower East Side of New York City was, in the beginning of the 20th century, the most densely populated place on the face of the earth. And a lot of Jews lived in the Lower East Side, Rivington Street and Hester Street, and down in that neck of the woods. And bagel bakeries were, tended to be below ground. They were unbelievably hot. Uh, the bakers, who, the shapers, made 800 or more bagels shaped, 800 or more bagels per hour for 10 hour shifts. Yeah, uh, and it's said that many of the bakers didn't recognize their own children because they were rarely at home. All they were doing was baking 
and sharing the bakery when they slept with cockroaches and rats. I learned a lot about bagels from a very, very good book. Maybe you can get a little close-up on that way. It's not a book about how to make the dough or shape it. It's just a book if you're interested in the cultural and historical aspects of bagels. That one I could really recommend. OK, we'll let these rest for a brief minute. And they've been in the oven now for? They have been in the oven now. They can. This is our good time. Yeah. Oh, yeah, look at that. We should lower the heat, too. Yep, you can do that. Yeah. <laughs> That was the timer. Yeah, perfect. How about that? Let me get these. So you start with them when on the silt pad and on the uh, board upside down. Right. And then the reason why this happens is because the traditional way is because if you had the bagels, which are wet, going on top of the oven, they would simply stick to the oven and you wouldn't be able to get them in the oven anyway. So that's the function of this. I don't often use these bread boards anymore unless I'm baking bagels in my wood burning oven, which is a really special type of bagel. Um, if you're baking on a sheet pan, you'll want to check the bottoms. And if the bottoms are getting too dark, which these are these, not. These are not then what you'll do is bake them on a second sheet pan. Put a, another heat buffer Double sheet it. pan yeah. down. Okay. My hope was to bake this third batch also on the pizza stone, but there's not room on it. So we'll just flip them over right here. And these will take good. another probably six minutes. I will give you six minutes on Thank you. this. A gentle six minutes. Okay. So if, because when we started we were having sound issues, you can follow the recipes by clicking the links that are in the description. The bagel recipe's in there, and then there are two other links. One is for King Arthur's milk bread recipe and another for mine that I'm using today. But the one that's my recipe also has a link to the video of making the dough. But Jeffrey has just flipped the bagels that were in the oven. He's shaped the dough that was waiting for him when he got here. And then he'll do the final shape so that you pretty actually right get now. there pretty much right now. So that really typical bagel shape. Um, do you ever do a shaping, um, or is it just you you hate it where you punch your finger through uh, essentially a bun? I don't do it that way. Yeah. No, I think I, that's fairly common, uh, but I've never done it that yeah. way. Yeah. I think the reason that so many people do do it is that it creates if you are not used to making the cylindrical shape it creates a more uniform bagel uh, if you haven't had enough practice. Sorry about all that noise. Okay, let's see if these are ready. Yep, they're ready. So do uh, shape them chronologically. So if you started here for the initial shaping, continue by starting the final shaping with them. You'll want them to be roughly 10 inches long. That's about 10 and a half but they have some shrink in them. And again, we don't want to taper. When you've got two, wrap them around your hand. Okay. So start by going down the center for a couple of strokes and then elongate them a little longer than you want them to be. Because they shrink back. Because they shrink. Wrap, overlap here. You can see that overlap, right? And then seam it. Bagels typically after they're shaped, they're refrigerated overnight. There's some indication that that was done so that the bagel bakers could take the Sabbath off. Oh. They couldn't work on the Sabbath. That makes sense. All right. Now, if you notice, this one, the hole is smaller than a couple of the other ones. So is this one. 
Once they've relaxed for just another few seconds, by all means, you can just do this, lay them back down. You could even do that the following day, but you'll want to be careful because if they are a little bit overrisen like mine were, then the following day they could uh, collapse when you do that. But what can be confusing for some people is that they'll look at that now and go, oh, that hole is too big for a bagel, not realizing that. It's going to rise. It's, it's going to rise, so and gonna, that hole is going to yes, compress. Good point. How you don't taper the ends is a miracle. Practice, practice, practice. Now, if you've ever seen old fashioned bagel shaping, or if you've ever been to Montreal, the fabled Montreal bagels, you'll see a different style than this. The way it's done typically is you'll mix the dough, ferment it, and then you'll have this mountain of dough on the bench and a long strip with a serrated knife is cut by the shaper and then they're not weighed. They cut a long strip and they just start rolling here, rip it off, do it around their hand. It's so fast you've got to slow the film down to watch it. Wow. So they're not, this is extra steps, but this is pretty typical in small production right. to do it this way. Yeasty bracelets. Yeasty bracelets. I like the fact that it had symbolic value as being a symbol of immortality. Yes. The ring shaped, right? There was a poem about the destitute bagel seller. This comes from Russia in the 20s. With little strength, I walk these streets, evicted and unwanted everywhere. My clothes are torn. I am unwashed. With tortured thoughts, I wander about. Buy bagels, fresh bagels, buy bagels, please. I need to sell, for I am poor and lost and homeless in this world. Oh, that's heartbreaking. <sighs> There's so much thought, meaning to such a small, round, lovely thing. Right? Yeah. So now, folks, I'm going to cover these nice and tightly so that they don't crust over, and they're going to get refrigerated right away. And you have another bag? And, and you refrigerate these overnight? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Technically, you could bake them later, but uh, if you do, just make sure they're very, very cold before you put them in the boiling water or they're going to really get puffy. I have a suggestion that you, t you check the bagels that are in here before you do yeah, that. Yeah, I'm just about to, actually. Because that um, oven's got some nice heat. I want to eat them. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Oh, yeah, these are done. Gorgeous. Oh, I love Let's that sound, see. too. Find another pan to put that on. I've got more pans if you need it. See, there's our... Was that the timer? That was our timer. That's what we like around here. We have, um, we have the psychic All timing right, ability. There's these. Okay, they why don't I put the... the entire I, time on the still pad. I'm just standing there. I can put these in the fridge. They're your bagels for tomorrow, so you I know. This is why I'm being very sensitive about it. That's right. <laughs> yeah, these are done too. Often the ones that start on the bagel boards take another minute or so. You may recall that the ones that started on the sill pat and the ones that started on the bagel board both had their seeds down to begin because then what happens, and I'll finish this thought and then it's up to you, okay? But I, also, I would love for you to actually show the board that you've made so that they can get a sense of what it looks like and if they could, you it's know. It's just a cheap board covered with baker's linen, right? And the reason why they were used and still are in many shops is because once you've dipped, the, the bagels are moist, you can't load them with a baker's peel. They're gonna stick or you're gonna wind up using gobs of semolina. Um, so they start on this with the seeds down for half the bake or so, and what that does is it gets this dry and firm. It doesn't bake it that much, but it firms it up so that then the board is typically then just flipped over in one go, mm -hmm. uh, and it finishes on a stone. 
And you soak that for how long did you soak that? Uh, I, had, I put it in the tub this morning. <laughs> While you're washing away, you've got your board in there? Not that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. Well, we'll go from, are we ready to go from one hole to the yep, other? I've got uh, <laughs> one hole to the yeah. other. I've got the finish of these. These are ready to rumble? Let's see. Oh, you're going to need. That's going to need another minute. Another minute. So if it's all right with you, I'll just walk behind you. Please do. Okay. So from bagel to donut. Check that description and you can get the link for the recipes. I'm using mine. That should be the second link, I think. Um, and this is my milk bread dough. And the reason that I like using this for donuts is because it is so tender. I like incredibly tender donuts. And because you have that method in, in the milk bread of uh, creating a lot of starch in the beginning with a tang tsang, um, they don't get really crispy on the outside. So that starch allows it to stay, once it comes out of the fryer, to be nice and soft and you don't get that crispiness because of that creation of the starch. Wait, are you boiling some of the flour? No, I, from the dough. So I made a milk bread dough, uh -huh. and that's where that is. So I made the tang tsang. Oh. So you are, you are gelatinizing that flour as you would for shu. Right. And then you add that to the remaining dough to create the most tender buns. I love it for in a loaf or for cinnamon rolls, but I adore them for donuts because like brioche, it's an incredibly tender dough. It's very soft. So when you're working with it at the very beginning, you think this is going to be impossible. So what you do is you refrigerate it. So I allow it to proof after I finish mixing it for an hour. I punch it down. I put it in the refrigerator for at least an hour before I shape it into anything. For donuts specifically, what I do is I will roll it out onto a floured parchment, and then 15 minutes before I'm ready to stamp it out, I will move it from the refrigerator to the freezer. And I'll put it in the freezer for 15 to 20 minutes, not to make sure that it's frozen solid, but to make sure that it's very, very stiff. So that this has been out, this was in the freezer, but now it's been out for a little bit, so it's warm. But what that will allow you to do is to stamp out really cleanly the donut shape so that when you lift it, it lifts off cleanly, which it may not, ah, oh, it did, it's a miracle. It'll lift off cleanly and keep that shape because if it is any warmer than that, what tends to happen is when you drop it onto your little piece of parchment, and I'll explain why I have that, it will become misshapen and we all like a very round donut, don't we? And I always make sure that I have individual pieces of parchment for each donut. And then I will proof them again until they're very tender on a sheet pan together, but I will space them because they get a little big. And you proof them until they almost look fragile. Look how much bigger they are. And they are, oh, they're pillowy and fragile and so much plumper than they were to begin with. But the reason that I make sure that they're on individual pieces of parchment is that I move them to the oil on the parchment so they maintain their shape until the very second they hit the oil. My oil right now is at 300, should be 50, 52, which is fine. So between 350, some people do 370, I think that's too hot. 360 is the height of my oil allowance uh, heat. And what I'll do is I'll find, very gently slip that in. It will start sizzling. I will get my little calipers and then I flip it over and I take away that parchment so that when it lands in there, it's not misshapen. Keeping it on that parchment is the perfect way for maintaining that perfectly round doughnutty shape. And then my preferred way of flipping them once they're the perfect color, chopsticks. I always have chopsticks because you can stick it right in the middle and flip it over. And I usually go for about a minute to two minutes and it's like, ba it's like the boiling of the bagels. It just depends on how hot the oil is, how fragile everything seems, and I'm going to keep checking the temperature of the oil. And yes, you can put in more than one into the oil, but since these, uh, these, these are actually weren't very cool, but the, the room is pretty cool, so it's going to draw down the temperature of the oil if you put too many in at once. 
If the temperature of the oil gets too low, what will happen is that the dough will start absorbing the oil and it'll get very greasy. And that is, it's really unpleasant to eat. If it gets too hot, so if it gets above 370, what will happen is that it will essentially seize the donut. It won't be able to expand and it will just essentially bake at that same uh, thickness as it went in. It won't expand. So let's, what'd you say? Look, little flippy whippy. I baked some earlier. I fried some earlier. My, Regina, can yeah. You, would you please talk about the seam, the pale seam around yes. the waist of a donut? Well, the pale seam is, in, is an indication to me that the dough is rising well. Mm -hmm. Also, that the, that the heat of that oil isn't too hot. It right. will not have a seam if this is above 370 right. degrees because it will not expand. Uh, growing up, we had krapfen, which I'm sure you've had, which are the, the filled donuts, my mom's favorite. And my favorite thing was to see just that pale seam yeah. around the edge and then that powder sugar on top. And then you see that jam just coming out from one little hole. I love you it so still much. Make those? I still make them. You, you bet. And cuffin are made during fashing, which is in February, which is like Mardi Gras. Yeah. So that's, uh, you can make them any time, of course. No one's stopping you. But that little semen is, is an indication of two things, that the oil isn't too hot and that your dough was ready to rumble, that it's, you want it to expand in there. So instead of baking it, you're frying it so that you get that lovely, gorgeous, there we go. So now I will leave it here for like just a hot second, quite literally, just to get some of that oil off. And then while it is still warm, I put it into my glaze. So this glaze is two cups of confectioner sugar with about three to four tablespoons of milk. And it will vary. So you want it to be runny enough that it just coats and then drips off when it's this warm. I have asbestos fingers. So I let that come off for a little bit just to coat it ever so slightly and then I will transfer it, usually straight to Ray's mouth, but in this case, no. Now you can see these, I just wanted to see the texture of the inside of the donut. So you can see that it is lovely and fluffy. Ray is responsible for that lovely work of making those bite marks. Well done, Ray. That's beautiful. And then I like to coat them entirely in that glaze because Ostensibly, these could be savory if they didn't have the coating on them. So I like the glaze to be top on bottom. the top and the bottom. And then I will add a glaze around if I'm doing chocolate or if I'm doing, in this case, I have a little cherry glaze. Hmm. So I replaced two tablespoons of the milk with a cherry puree. Hmm. So it'll have that lovely, just a and little- And you still do that one top to bottom? Top no, bottom? I'll just do that on the top. I'll do a uh -huh. little strip along the top hmm. just to give a little punch of flavor. Uh, just be careful as you're doing this. Obviously, the oil is going to be incredibly hot, right? The other thing is that continue taking the temperature of the oil because it can, if you're putting a lot in at once, it can get very low and that means you're going to have greasy donuts or it can get very high and then they'll start to essentially seize and they won't have that lovely ring and be gorgeous and tasty. Have you ever heard of uh, people using brioche dough as a Yeah, donut? absolutely. Brioche is a pretty typical these days donut. Yeah. I just prefer this because I am, and I'm going to name drop, I'm a Krispy Kreme fan. I like them really soft. Um, and this kind of mimics that lovely, lovely tenderness on mm -hmm. the inside. I never had one of those, but so, they're as good as people say. I think they are. If you see a hot do donut now sign, run, don't walk, and get yourself a donut. <laughs> But what's, what's interesting though is that the reason I take these steps to make sure that they keep their shape is that people get very frustrated that their donuts don't look like the donuts the that you would get in the ones. shop. Yeah, yeah. And it's because things go on conveyors. Every, you know, when it's fried, it's going on a conveyor. When it's glazed, it's on a conveyor. So, you know, very few human hands are sitting there distending the dough mm -hmm. and making them unround. So in this case, if you have that little piece of parchment, it goes a long way in keeping the shape of the donut. Just make sure that you have these little tongs so that you can grab it out. Mm -hmm. And it just makes life easier, these a few little tools. Do you ever um, fry patashu? 
I do. Yeah. I make churros with yeah. padashu. Uh -huh. Ah. Yeah. yeah. And look, like, crullers yeah. uh, and churros. So that would be shoe dough is what you make eclairs, profiteroles out of. And I, um, oh yes, I do that quite happily. Yeah. I did, had one problem. I was, I was frying them once live and I had new clogs that were new buck and I dropped a piece of uh, shoe before I piped it onto my new shoe and I almost said something else. Shh. <laughs> and I was like, stop myself. I was really good about it. I was so upset though that I had that, that, that unsightly shoe stain on my lovely, my lovely new clogs. But I love just that, that ring makes me really mm. happy. And that's the color I like. And it's usually this color right here is an indication to me that the inside is done as well. When I roll them out, I make sure that it's no thicker than about a quarter of an inch, too thick, and then it will take too long to, ba to fry all the way through. And then um, you're gonna have a raw in the middle donut, or you're gonna have essentially a very, very dark and yeah. very tough yeah. um, outer exterior. So this little, these little chopsticks are so handy. So when you order Chinese, grab a couple extra chopstick mm. packets for this. I also use chopsticks to bore holes in my, the bottom of my eclairs. Oh yeah. Yeah, sure, to sure, fill sure. them. And um, you could either. reuse this oil? I, if I don't sully it too much, I will reuse it, though mm. if you reuse it too much, then it can impart an unpleasant yeah. taste because that, any bits that kind of fall in there will start burning and then that will yeah. kind of so perfume the So how many times, oil. if you didn't sully it, how many times would you reuse it? Two, two times, usually. So three times total, reuse twice? Yeah, so three times. Yeah, three times two. But you just want to make sure you, you're going to smell it when it gets mm -hmm. hot. You're going to actually look in. I will, at times, sieve it if I have to, if there are dark bits in there that I know that sieving will take care of it. Um, mainly because it is, for, first of all, it's wasteful just to toss all that oil. It's also, once you get rid of it, it's a pain to siphon it into, I always keep the container for the oil, mm -hmm. and then I siphon it back in. Mm -hmm. uh, or I need a car where I can just pour it into the car and use that for my well, oil. Well, here's another question. Oils have different smoking points, et yes. cetera, et cetera. So yes. are there some that are better than others? Yes. Uh, so I like to use vegetable or canola or even peanut oil for donuts because they have a high smoking point. Do not use, Olive. for instance, um, you wouldn't use ever, um, what am I going to say, olive oil. Thank no. you. Uh, you could use rapeseed oil, which has a pr pretty high. That's canola, rapeseed. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but you will see them at the health food store as rapeseed and not as canola. And grapeseed. Oh, yeah. Um, but I tend to get the organic simply because uh, there are so many pesticides that go into yeah. the process of, of grape growing that I get the organic. So yeah, and if you use um, canola oil, if it's not organic, then overwhelming possibility is it's genetically modified. Yeah. At least in the U.S. Most yeah. So that's chocolate that's getting. So if you want to avoid the little lovely drips, which I kind of love, you would put, as I had my glaze, plain glaze in there, you would put the glaze in something that could contain an entire donut and you would just dip the top in there mm -hmm. and you would let it kind of pool off and then mm -hmm. you turn around and you would just have a lovely ring around there. Mm. Um, but m more chocolate, more better. And then here's a little cherry just to go along the top. And that is literally, I just took some of that milk out of the recipe and I added some cherry puree. And then, you know, sprinkles never hurt anybody. Oh, that's so kid friendly now. It is kid friendly. Well, it's also Gazina friendly. <laughs> so again, if you want a little more, uh, I would say pure, ring, you would take it upside down and you would dunk it in. Mm -hmm. Harder to do when you fully glaze the donut because then you start marring the glaze. Sure. So if you just wanted to keep them plain and then just dip the tops in the chocolate or the other flavor, feel free to do that without glazing the and whole thing. And both of those are going to harden those top glazes, yes? They will get, yes, they will, you can see right here how when my lovely Ray bit into them, how they crackle where he bit into them and that's where the glaze got nice and so this here was, it's the same as this one? Same as that one, I yeah. See. Same as that one. 
And they are delicious. So, Jeffrey, after we're done, oh yeah, there's a donut with your name on it. Why do you think I come here once a week? Oh, here's another wonderful glaze, and this is so typical of our area because we can get it quite easily. Is just you know maple cream. Mm -hmm. I will just pipe the maple cream onto a hot donut instead of any other glaze because it it will mattify just like that will, and it is glorious. Mm. It is so good. So it's like glaze in a bottle. It's pretty expensive if you're not from the area, but it's worth that little extra just to have that just fabulous, mm. pure maple mm. goodness. Oh, that sounds great. It's so good. Mm. So Jeffrey, what's up next for you? Well, we have to mix bagel dough. And if you look at the instructions uh, that are posted online, it says to mix for about three minutes on first speed to incorporate your ingredients and then to turn the mixer to medium speed for four to five minutes to get a good strong gluten development. However, bagel dough is quite firm, and with a mixer like this, three or four minutes on medium speed might really be too much. So what I usually do if I'm not in a, you know, working with a big production mixer is if I'm with a KitchenAid or another stand mixer, I'll usually mix for eight to 10 minutes on first speed, and then if the dough seems to need it, I'll go for about maybe at the most one minute on medium speed. Gazina, could I ask you please yes. to, um, get me some water? I will get you some water. You got it. Let's see. Where's my formula? Also, I have your formula. Okay. okay, yeah. Just the final dough water, if you would. I thought I had your formula. Let's see. Water coming up. Formula in a moment. Okay. Again, this particular formula uses a pot fermenté or a little pre-dough, not required, but pretty historically accurate. Again, if you like sourdough, you can add maybe 15 or so percent of your flour into a sourdough the day before. If you like whole grains, they can certainly find a good place in bagel dough. So they're pretty versatile as far as that goes. I'm, I'm looking up the... Um... Thanks, because I can't find my formula. So here we have the pot fermenté. It's definitely fully ripe. You can probably see that it, it's not doming. It's not <coughs> collapsed. If it was shaped like this, it would have meant it was really overrisen. This is not seriously overrisen. One reason why it's a little bit not domed is because uh, 25 minutes on secondary roads in Vermont is going to distort anything. 397. 397. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I get you anything else? No, this is going to be it. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you're using a stand mixer like this, <coughs> always, always, always put your liquids in first. Because if you don't, you can mix for 20 minutes. And when you take the dough out, you're going to see unhydrated flour on the bottom of the bowl. So always first thing is liquids. Pot fermenté. Salt. Yeast. This is malt powder, diastatic malt powder. If you it's, don't have malt powder, can yeah. you use something else? If you don't have malt powder, you can omit it entirely. The function of the malt powder is the following. Since the dough is fairly old by the time it goes in the oven, you know, a full 24 or more hours old, um, a lot of the sugars have been consumed by the yeast, so there's different flour enzymes that are converting starch into sugar. That gives the yeast something to eat because yeast needs to metabolize sugar. Um, and when the amylase enzymes break the starch from very complex chains down into simple sugars, the yeast can consume them. If the yeast uses up all the sugars, then your dough will tend to be very lusterless. Sure, I can. Is that better? Okay. So 
45 that goes in. So to avoid having a lusterless overaged dough, the addition of malt powder is basically giving amylase enzymes into the dough. So the malt is called diastatic. I don't want to get too complicated here. But diastatic malt is malt where the enzymes are still active. And so these now give the dough an opportunity to have more of the sugars available for the yeast and also more sugars available to color the dough to a rich hue. But not the same thing as malted milk powder. Not, nothing at all like malted milk powder. Because that, I had a friend who was ready for this class, went to, to get her order at King Arthur and said, I need malt powder and didn't know that there was a differentiation between the two. And when she showed it to me, I said, oh, oh, I'm sorry, this is not the right stuff. That's Yikes. for the malt flavor and the sweetness, like a malted milk ball, yeah. not the same. And that's incredibly confusing. So just know that you're looking for the di diastatic malt powder. Diastatic means the enzymes are still active. Non-diastatic means the enzymes have been deactivated via heat, right? Sorry if this is starting to get too technical. It's helpful. It's yeah, a helpful, I especially helpful. when you end up getting the wrong malt powder. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just to know that they are not one and the same. So you can already hear that this mixer is slightly struggling with the firm dough. So if we were to put this to medium speed, it might really harm the motor. So we'll leave this on first pretty much the entire time. And in all likelihood, we won't need to do second speed or medium speed at all. Now, as far as flour goes, traditionally bagels were made with high gluten flour, and today that's still very, very common. Um, this will also be determined, your flour choice will also be determined by how chewy you want your bagel to be. High gluten flour is going to give you a much chewier result if you want something a little less chewy, then you might use a flour with, I don't know, maybe a point or so, one percentage point less protein. And that's what I've done here. So this, instead of having roughly 14% protein, has just under 13% protein. And for me, that's plenty of chew. I also suspect that when the Lower East Side Manhattan Jewish bakers were making bagels 100 years ago, high gluten flour possibly had less protein than today's high gluten flours. So another thing is if you just say, you know, I don't want to keep all kinds of different bags of flour. I have all purpose flour. It's very versatile. It's a good quality flour. It gives good flavor. You can use all purpose flour with your bagels. Unbleached. Unbleached, right? Oh, only unbleached. Only yes. unbleached. Yeah. And if you do that, keep in mind another flour fact, and that is that as protein percentage goes up, so too does the, the, the water absorption. So if you made bagels with, say, 58% hydration um, and you used a 14% protein, it's going to be firmer than if you made the same formula with 12% protein flour. That being said, you may, if you use all-purpose flour for your bagels, you may hold back just a little bit of the water mm -hmm. and it'll have a firmer consistency or it'll have a consistency closer to a high gluten flour that had all the water. I hope that made sense. But also hydration, when, so some people get confused about hydration percentages. So you would look at the flour as 100%, right? And then look at the water as, so if you had 600 grams of flour and 600 grams of water in a recipe, it's 100% hydration because right. it's equal to the amount of flour. And in this case, for 100 grams of flour, there's about 58 grams of water, meaning 58% hydration. Cooks go crazy because for cooks, everything adds up to 100. For bakers, <laughs> flour is 100 and everything yeah. else is expressed as a percentage of the flour, which means every formula that uses baker's percent is going to be substantially higher than 100 total percentage points. Often it's over 200 percentage points. So, so
So as this keeps mixing, can I show you some fan mail that I got? Yes, show me fan mail. Often I'll, after class, there's all this bread and I'll just drive around and knock on a friend's door. Or You're like the Santa Claus of bread. I got this in the mail. I love your bread. Uh, oh, Isaac, that's the sweetest Isn't thing. That, that is so, so great. Yeah, I was really, really touched. I think that is fantastic. Yeah, he's a little six-year-old neighbor boy. Isaac appreciates good bread. Yep, yep. He was raised well. So can I cut a bagel or two? Uh, yes, please. Would you like poppy or sesame? Uh, sesame, please. Ray, what are you going to have after you're done work? You can't have it now. Poppy for you? Okay. Okay. You can see this is a fairly shattery crust, which is the way I like it when it's fresh like this. And the reason for that is, again, we went into a very hot oven. Don't give yourself a bagel cut. That used to be the common, uh, one of the most common injuries going into emergency rooms is the bagel is that cut. Right? Yeah, now it is, can you guess what it is now? Uh, no. Avocado cut. Avocado cut? Yeah. Wow. I'm a font of useless knowledge. Do you like cream cheese? Uh, yeah. I, I'm what a, That's a, for you, I, right? I'm a schmearologist. A schmearologist. And can you make this dough by hand? You could. And how many hours would that take? <laughs> <laughs> Knead it till it's good and strong if you do it by hand. It'll probably take you 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Yeah. So it, Christmas time, well, the whole family goes off somewhere without a mixer, invariably. Huh. And I always make um, cinnamon rolls for, for our breakfast. And I do it all by hand, and I have, it's the best workout. It's 15 minutes of just bicep work. Wow. And, um, but I know that if I have that timer on for 15 minutes, my dough will be good and ready. So this has been now just about eight minutes. So we'll go a couple more minutes. So these are the donuts. I just dip them into the glaze as opposed to piping it on. So you can see that's how it gets a little more um, trim, not so sloppy, but also not as sweet. So that's really up to you how you want to put that glaze on. But you have to make sure that whatever vessel you put that glaze in, it is wide enough for the entire donut. You hear that mixer? It's a moaning and a groaning. And that's been 10 minutes. So let's check it for strength. This has definitely got plenty of strength. What, what, and that was, was that at one? That was, yeah, on low speed for 10 minutes. Okay. Keep in mind, it's gonna get folded in an hour, at which point the strength will increase. Keep in mind that even overnight under refrigeration up to a point, strength will increase unless it's refrigerated for too long, at which point it'll start losing some of its strength. And you're not greasing that? No. And that's why a lot of people will just pour a ton of oil into a bowl. You don't because? Because I have one of these. And you can scrape it out. Right? I, don't I like grease, it. I don't grease bowls personally. Oh, is it bagel time? 
Thank you. Oh, do you have a preference for your type of uh, donut? Uh, These don't have extra glaze, so that's the chocolate and the cherry. That that has. I'm, I like the looks of this. Do, yeah, it's all yours. Okay. And here's another thing that when you are punching out donuts, obviously this is sitting out here. There's a lot of extra dough for this one. Yeah. And this will make 12 donuts if you roll it out correctly and you'll still have quite a bit of dough left over. What I will do then is I will take that dough and put it into a very rough cylinder. It ain't pretty, yeah. but I'll proof it and I'll bake off a loaf of milk bread. Oh. And it's still, because it is such a tender dough, it can take that secondary yeah. roll. It will still, it'll have a little tighter crumb than it would have originally, mm -hmm. but it isn't wasteful. I don't like the donuts from a second kneading, yeah. but you don't waste the dough. You can just compact it and do uh, a cylindrical uh, little fold and put it in a loaf pan and you get quite a cute little loaf of bread. I can't believe how tender yeah. this is. It is, oh they're super God. tender. I love milk bread. Wait, I need this together. Wow. Okay. Ah. Perfect chew. I'm so not ever going to eat a Krispy Kreme donut. If I ever have donut needs, I know where you live. I will supply all of your donut needs. That's fantastic. That's what I'm here for. All these donuts. <clears throat> you just have to be careful. Hot oil. Have the right tools around you early on. So how you would mise en place your ingredients to actually make the dough. Kind of have all the implements you need to fry them so that you're not over frying them. You're not using something inappropriate and you'll end up burning yourself. Um, not that it's not worth burning yourself a little for a donut, but I wouldn't recommend it. But have fun. What about next week? Oh, you have a plan. Yeah, next week we're going to return to the realm of sourdough. And I'd like to make one of my favorite breads. Um, maybe we're on a little bit of a New York theme because this would be a really, really good version of a true New York deli rye bread. Oh, um, so we'll make we're Rubens. Be acidifying some rye flour in a sourdough phase, and we'll make a special. I'm not going to tell you because if I say the word in German, you'll throw me right out on my <laughs> ear. But we're going to make you. some. Uh, you'll see next week. Okay, we'll you see. You need next. to be surprised now and again. Too. Yeah, I do. I like surprises, yeah. though. I can usually figure these things out. <laughs> uh, and I think next week I would like to do an inverse puff pastry. Yay! So something, some lamination. I think if people have time. Lamination is a lovely thing to learn right now. Absolutely. Because it takes patience. Uh, it ta there's a lot of visual and f uh, it's tactile as well mm. to make sure that the and butter. Versatile. And Indeed. versatile. And so you have to be able to play with the dough for a while to know when the butter temperature's right, mm -hmm. uh, when, whether it's time to do your folds. Yeah. And oh, that'll be great. Even if it's a subpar inverse puff, it's usually still a pretty great puff. And those of you who have made puff pastry before, you know that you have a block of dough and then you've got a, a slab of butter and you enclose the butter in the dough so the butter's on the inside. With inverse puff pastry, the butter's on the outside. It's on the outside. It's magic though when it, it is. comes out. Yeah. And one of the other reasons that I thought it's a good time to make it, our weather is still rel relatively cool. So it doesn't make Relatively that... Relatively cool. It's May. There's it's leaves on the trees. We're going to wake up to snow tomorrow. We're going to get snow tomorrow. So I figured what better time <laughs> to start playing with butter on the outside mm. than when it's so cold in mm. Vermont. And if you have a little, little marble, that'll be handy. If you can get your hands on uh, a high fat percentage of European butter. Like 82, 83. I use 86. But that is Vermont creamery. I use our Vermont butter is for it. Is it unsalted? It's unsalted. 86? 86 is unsalted. Oh, yeah. Good. Great. It'll be well, fun. Sorry we had a snafu with the uh, sound for a while. But hopefully you followed along and we still had fun. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Jeffrey. Yeah, thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Thanks, folks. We'll see you next Stay week. Gone. Be kind to each other.